and warm welcome to Metronic Symposium Single versus Two Stand Techniques in the Left Main, the Impact of the EBC Main. My name is Goran Stanković. I'm here in Belgrade at Belgrade Synergy City Pod, and it's really our great pleasure to officially introduce and discuss the results of the most important study of the year, EBC Main. So join us if you want to understand the results of the EBC Main and the impact to clinical practice to discuss the EBC main outcome of one versus two stand technique and to hear an update on the latex, latest onyx bifurcation evidence. And we have great faculty. First, Dr. David Hildig Smith, the PI of the study, and he will present the result. And then we have discussants, Dr. Jens Flensted Lassen, Dr. Gabor Todt, and Dr. Zhang from China. So I think time has come to ask also questions. We have chat master, Dr. Tom Johnson, uh, who will be happy to select all important questions coming through the chat and pass on so we can try to answer as many questions or your comments related to EBC main study. David, floor is yours. I think time has finally come to present the study. Thank you very much. So I'm going to present the results of the EBC main study, as Goran said. These are my conflicts of interest. So the background to the study is that there have been lots of coronary bifurcation trials over the years which have looked at uh, non-left main coronary bifurcations and have routinely showed no benefit or a systematic two-stone strategy, Nordic, EBC1, EBK, et cetera. And this has been the case even in patients with larger side branches with more complex disease, true bifurcations. So, for example, the EBC2 study showed no benefit for systematic two-versus stenting. And actually, in fact, a little appreciated fact is that the outcomes may, in fact, be less with the two-stent strategy over the time. If you take the combination, for example, of the Nordic and BBC1 trials, which are now wrote to the old, followed them out to five years, there is actually a mortality disadvantage for those who had the two-stent strategy. And that's very important to bear in mind as we investigate this topic. So the left main is often described as a different animal. There's a wider angle between the vessels. Neither vessel is a branch, and they're both important vessels in their own right. Uh, there's more calcification and fibrosis, greater need for vessel preparation. This means that in some respects, you might expect the two-stem technique to be worse than in non left main vessels, particularly because of the wide separation of the two vessels. Um, and actually, there is ample evidence from non-randomized trials suggesting the outcome is worse. But at the same time, there's evidence from Dr. Chen's group uh, which supports the more complex strategy, the, the DK crush strategy in the left main. So the EBC main trial was designed in 2015 and it was designed to compare two strategies. One is the provisional stepwise layer strategy where complexity is added as required to get to the result that we need. Uh, and the other is a systematic two-stone strategy in patients with true left main bifurcation disease. Uh, the Resolute Onyx was selected as the study device because of its broad size matrix. It has four and a half and five millimeter versions, and this is helpful can tolerate and accommodate a left main up to six millimeters without difficulty, which is very important for the setting. Uh, technical details of the study are important to discuss because this really was a technical comparison between two techniques. So the provisional, as outlined in the EBC consensus documents, it's step-by-step, -step, it's layered, it's logical. Important points to state are that the POP was a mandated part of this procedure and the KISS was also a mandated part of the procedure because of the side vessel disease. With the systematic approach, the uh, operator could choose which technique they wish to use, again, step by step. And importantly, we expected operators to use high-pressure osteobifurcation dilatations 
with a mandated kiss plus or minus a final pot. Here are the demographics within the study. You see nothing particularly unusual here. Uh, an average syntax score between the groups of 22 to 23. Here is the summary characteristics of the study. So looking at the numbers of stents used, the stent of length, procedure duration, fluoroscopy time, et cetera. So those, all of these favor the stepwise provisional strategy. Uh, looking at procedural flow, this is what happened to each individual patient as they went through the study. And the thing I want to draw your attention to is that in the group who had a stepwise provisional approach, only one out of five of them ended up with a two-stent final implant. That's really important. The other group, of course, all of them had two stents because that was the randomization. But in the group where it was taken step by step, only one in five patients actually ended up with two stents. Here's the primary endpoint. In one year, the composite of death, MI, target lesion revascularization, 14.7% in the semi provisional versus 17.7% in the systematic dual. This is not a statistically significant difference. Secondary endpoints are the individual components of that primary endpoint and stem thrombosis. And the one result I'd like to draw your attention to here is that target lesion revascularization uh, was in fact numerically more common in the systematic dual approach. Again, not statistically, but perhaps a trend. Here are those results shown in graphical form. And so what, what do I think we've learned from this study? And we'll open it for discussion in a, in a minute. Firstly, of course, actually the outcomes of true bifurcation left main stem stenting with resolute onyx had good outcomes across the board, independent of the technique chosen. I think it's fair to say that numerically fewer serious adverse events did occur with the stepwise provisional strategy. Consumables, procedure time, et cetera, et cetera, all favored the less involved strategy. As I've stressed, only one fifth of the patients in the provisional group required a second stent. And that, I think, brings me to the, what I would say is the, the main conclusion of the study. And that is that when looking at the left main bifurcation, people often say, oh, I'm going to use two stents, I'm going to use two stents. But actually, you don't need to prejudge the issue. You can take it step by step. Prepare, stent the main vessel, pot, kiss, and only then if you need to, a second step. And as I've said, only one-fifth in the study was shown to need them. So patients are equally well treated, statistically, with a stepwise layered provisional approach as with a more complex dual stent implant procedure. And I think it's fair to say that the stepwise provisional strategy should remain the approach of choice for the majority of left-main bifurcation interventions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dave. I'm thinking uh, of the Palais de Congrès, and I, I would expect uh, a deep breath coming from 4,000 people inside the audience when you announce the results. Finally, uh, we speak since 2016 about TBC Maine. Uh, finally, today you officially present the results. And uh, uh, when you start with presentation, I think it's very important to say that left main is a different animal. We have several randomized studies and registries in non-left main lesions, but in bifurcation lesions, there was DK crash five until now. And as of today, we could put into perspective also the EBC main. But why left main is different? I think we should go to Professor Jens Lassen and he will uh, share with us his understanding what are the unique challenges of the left main. So let's start with the presentation of Prof. Lassen. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk today at this EuroPCR and on the topic understanding the unique challenges of the left main. My name is Jens Flenster Lassen. I am an interventional cardiologist from Denmark. Uh, it's extremely important when we have these discussions on how to make technical advancement and technical treatment of uh, bifurcations to discuss which area we're actually working in. 
Today, we are working in the left main. These are my potential conflicts of interests. And the reason for mentioning the left main is actually that the left main is different from other bifurcations in many respects. And most of those respects actually come back to some of the technical challenges and technical issues we need to discuss. But first of all, the left main supplies more myocardium than any other bifurcation, which means that if you make mistakes or, or actually put areas at risk, then there is serious implications. The side brands most often in this bifurcation is the circumflex, and the problem there on occlusion is not acceptable. There's a direct takeoff of the aorta, which means that one end of the proximal part is actually uh, the aortic uh, osteum, making uh, limitations to choice of stent. Most importantly, maybe, is that the left main have a very large diameter, but even more important is that there's a huge step down in diameter to the uh, side branches, the left main uh, down to LID or the left main down to circumflex, which actually puts some uh, stress into what to do with a stent that may fit the anatomy. The left main is often very short. There's often a trifurcation in the left main, makes it even more difficult. And the bifurcation angle is generally larger than in most other bifurcations. And the problem with the left main diameter is also that it may be above the maximum dilatation capacity of most available coronary stents. In this cartoon, we have tried to picture the, all the things I've just mentioned, but as you can see, this is not a straightforward tubular thing. There is some biological changes that could be calcium, there is the artificium, there is the angle, there is a curve to the uh, side branches and the main branches that every each of these things make this bifurcation different from one, much of the others. So this also means that you need to have a different approach and attention to this kind of bifurcation than in non-left main bifurcations. Most of all, respect the initial anatomy and remember to keep the stenting technique as simple, swift and safe as possible because there's much more at risk. This is just to remind all of you that coronary vessels, like many other issues in nature, divide in a fractal manner. This is uh, pictures from Google Earth of riverbeds. And as you can see, there is this division in a fractal manner of most of the uh, rivers around the world. It's exactly the same in the left main, which means that the proximal diameter in the left main is not the same as the distal diameter, which we have already touched a bit upon. But that means that when you try to put in a tubular stent here, it won't fit in both ends. That actually point to the fact that you need to optimize the tubular stent and actually manufacture it after it, implanting it so it fits the biology. This is done by implanting the stent with respect to the distal diameter and take a shorter balloon and actually treat the proximal part of the stent with another diameter to fit the two diameters and opens to the side brands without going too deep and close the side branch or too, too uh, proximal and uh, uh, don't open properly up to the side branch. So this is one of the first issues. If we go into the techniques in the provisional pathway, which is actually a way of implanting a stent in a stepwise uh, manner to, to uh, actually build upon each step in treatment, we place the stent, with respect to the distal diameter, do the putt, recross, do a kissing balloon inflation, and do a repot. And then we have actually manufactured the tapered stent to fit the biology. In this running picture from the visible heart laboratories in Minneapolis, we can see the manufacturing of that stent with the proximal optimization techniques running at the moment now. So. It was very obvious that we need to enlarge the proximal stent because there was stoting, floating stent struts. So here we have the stent implanted and very nicely dilated. 
after kissing, we will have this result, which actually point to the fact that we have opened the proximal part, fit the distal part, and make an easy access to the side brands. And this is actually the first step of the provisional pathway. The beauty of this technique is they develop stepwise and you can build upon it over time. If you need another stent, it's easy to do it with different techniques, either a T, which is just to the takeoff, a tap or a culotte, which means that it's easy to actually treat every kind of a bifurcation in this manner. This is a micro CT of a tubular stent manufactured to fit the left main going to the main branch or across the main branch and opening the stent struts. And here, here we see what happens if we need another stent. This is a T stenting here and a pro provisional tap in this area. And this is a provisional culotte, which is also possible in this technique. And here in the bottom, we actually have the result of a DK cross denting. The DK cross denting is not possible to do out of a provisional pathway. The DK cross denting is a two stent technique up front and will always end with two stents, while the provisional pathway will actually build from the simplicity into more complex steps until it also ends with two stents if needed. And that actually is one of the things that you really need to pay attention to in, uh, in stenting the left main. If you want to keep it simple, you need to choose a, a technique that is safe and simple. The provisional actually the pathway delivers these thing. It's a philosophy starting with one stent. It reconstructs the vessel anatomy. It produced, uh, the producer develops stepwise and it can end with two stents if needed. DK cross is a very good option also in uh, left main stenting, but it needs the decision making that you from the very beginning of the procedure know you will end with two stents. You will definitely really very seldom know that for sure, which actually talks into starting provisional, keep it simple, keep it safe, reduce cost and complexity and reduce the risk of adverse device biology interaction. So thank you very much for your attention with this statement from the Danish philosopher Søren Kierkegaard. Life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jens. This was excellent overview. And now let's go back to 2016 when we discussed study design, rational methodology. So I would like to ask Dave, to remember uh, what was the time when we decided to really precisely define each of the strategies to be uh, used in the EBC main and how the rational of the study was based on non-left main studies and expecting the results of DK crash. Uh, Dave, fl floor is yours. First, in the first instance, it was about 2009 when we looked at this. The actual design of the study was um, set about 2015. I mean, it was an obvious study to do, to take it back from what we've done with uh, EBC1, EBC2, come back to the left main. Um, but uh, obviously it took a, took a while in getting the support, and we're very grateful to Medtronic for that, and uh, actually setting the study up in, in 30 different centres in Europe. Uh, so... Our main goal was to define provisional as a stepwise layered strategy, not as a single stand comparison versus two stands. So I think Jens is the best person to uh, describe uh, what does stepwise provisional layered strategy mean? Thank you very much, Goran. And, and again, thank you, uh, Dave, for presenting the results. But the stepwise is, as I said in the presentation, a philosophy. And uh, one of the things that we really need to look into when we are treating these patients is the technique we use to manufacture a tubular stent to, uh, to a tapered device that fits a very uh, ununiform biology. So this actually pay great attention to manufacture the first stent 
with respect to a smaller distal diameter and a proximal diameter and still open up according to the angle between the two vessels and open up to the uh, side brands. So this is actually a unique thing done for every bifurcation. And if the first stand input is actually placed properly and they have been paid great attention to lesion preparation and implanting of the stent, then it's time to stop to evaluate if the second stent is needed or maybe an optimized kissing. And that actually is again a way where you, it's possible to stop at every step. If you, for instance, choose another uh, there is a different uh, in the armamentarium, then you actually have to evaluation of, uh, of the vessels. So this is, from a technical point of view, a bit different. And of course, as we have been discussing, the DK cross technique is extremely effective, but it's not possible to keep it more simple than two stent done properly. So this is the dilemma, actually. And this is, again, one of the things that is important to uh, evaluate when you're looking into the trials, comparing different techniques. And that a provisional philosophy is not a single stand technique or two stand technique. It's a philosophy. So it's not a comparison of one stand versus two stand. It's the comparison of how to do a thing stepwise compared to do it up front, double stenting immediately. Thank you, Jens. Uh, Dave, uh, what about planning two stand strategies up front? Was there any limitation regarding the techniques? which could be used in the study. And uh, we based description of techniques on EBC consensus document. So please uh, help us better understand the methodology of the study. Yeah, so the methodology was uh, in the provisional strategy was set out as in the consensus documents. We had uh, preparation of the main vessel, stand the main vessel, pot, kiss, and then decide do you need to do something more or not? And in four-fifths of the cases, the operators decided that was enough. They got a good result. And in only one-fifth, they decided to put a second stem. In the other group, where you had dedicated two-stem strategy right from the start, people were at liberty to choose whichever technique they thought suited the anatomy or suited themselves best. You know, people should only really be doing a, a modest number of two-stem strategies per year. So. For many people, culotte is their preferred option. For other people, perhaps DK crush, etc. In the study, as it happened, about 50% were culotte and uh, only a small proportion of DK crush. Okay. Uh, was the imaging uh, uh, suggested as uh, or recommended, or it was part of the randomization process? No, well, uh, it's a shame actually, because I really wanted to have IVAS as a randomization within the study. But unfortunately, even at the setup, it, it was uh, too divisive. Some people couldn't uh, get compensated for it. Some people wouldn't do procedures without. Some people that we wouldn't always do it with. It became too difficult to incorporate it, which was a real shame, actually. But in the study, fewer than you might have expected actually had the intravascular ultrasound, 35% of their outs overall, which actually, funnily enough, was not dissimilar to what they had in the DK crush study as well. Yeah, I think there is really an uh, excellent opportunity to have uh, Professor Zhang also as a faculty. Uh, he was one of the most important people helping Prof Chen in developing DK Crush, and uh, I saw him performing DK Crush. They really clearly performed DK Crush step by step in seven steps, and I would like to include him in the discussion and ask, uh, are you surprised with this? neutral result of the EBC main study compared to DK crash? Yeah, first, uh, congratulations to David, the excellent uh, trial. And also, I'm not uh, surprised the result of the EBC main studies. Uh, this is a randomized study comparing uh, stepwise provisional versus uh, uh, two stand technique. But uh, my question is, uh, how many percent of uh, 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 Curot or DK crush uh, technique in the systemic uh, uh, two stand technique. I think uh, 
uh, which will uh, have impact on the clinical out outcomes. So in DK Crush uh, 3 trial, it's also a randomized study compared uh, 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 common cure-out versus DK crush at one year and the three year uh, clinical follow-up. Actually, um, DK crush was associated with a lower uh, rate of uh, uh, MACE, including uh, uh, T, uh, TR and uh, uh, TVMI. So uh, in our daily practice, especially for uh, def, uh, complex uh, uh, left man by patient lesions, especially for longer lesion at the ostimal circumflex, I think uh, uh, to stand technically uh, would still be mandatory uh, for the treatment of this kind of complex by patient lesions. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Prof. Zan. Uh, Dave, would you like to uh, elaborate on the two stand techniques used? Uh, what was the proportion of culotte or uh, DK crush in our study? Yeah, so the proportion of culotte was about 30%. The proportion of DK crush was about 5%. I think really that, I mean, this, this wasn't the, the, the focus of the study as such, but I think probably it is fair to say that when you use a two ten strategy, it probably doesn't matter hugely. It doesn't make much sense that it should matter hugely if you do DK mini crush, T, tap, lot, so long as you do it exactly as you should. In other words, so long as you pay attention to detail. Now, some people looking at the studies that have been done so far would say, well, the Europeans have really championed the strategy and they've absolutely nailed how to do it. And they're systematic and they're stepwise and they're logical in how they do it. And, and they're probably better at that, perhaps, than at the two sets of Conversely, one could potentially argue, or hazard to argue, that the Chinese groups who've championed the DK crush have really nailed down absolutely how to do that well and correctly, and therefore get optimal results from that, and are less perhaps favorably minded towards the provision strategy. And I think this study shows that both viewpoints are, are valid, and that actually so long as you do the procedure really carefully, really systematically, step by step, you can get pretty good results with either. Now, there may be a small indication in our study that the two-step strategy had slightly less good outcomes in the one-year analysis. And we'll have to see again in three years. But I think that it, it, it does also draw on not just differences in approach and differences in um, uh, decision making about how you do procedures, but also perhaps differences in the actual anatomy. So, for example, in the in the uh, DK crush studies, the syntax score is higher. Uh, side branch, well, not a side branch, side vessel lesion length is longer. Uh, whereas in our study, the side vessel lesion length is shorter, and the syntax score is less. So. In many of the DK brush study patients, it would be quite hard to get away without a second stem. An average side branch lesion length of 16 millimeters, that's hard to get away without a second. In fact, of course, that explains why the most 50% of the patients in the provision in that study did it with two stem. So, I mean, I think we, we're looking at two slightly different um, groups of patients and two slightly different approaches to how the operators. Uh, consider the procedures, and, and both are valid. Thanks. I think it's also important now to comment on the device that was used. Uh, as you said in the beginning, we decided to use, because of the uh, availability of stents with different expansion capacity resolutonics. So I think we should go now to Gabor Tot, who will tell us more details about resolutonic stents and the data coming from the bench. In the next few minutes, I would like to show you what are the uh, prerequisites for a good uh, left main stent. So when we talk about left main PCI, there is a couple of technical challenges what our uh, device has to cope with. And these are, I call them like diameter challenge, the side cell challenge, and the guiding catheter challenge. 
So what is a diameter challenge? The diameter challenge uh, is the diameter mismatch between distal main branch and distal side branch. You know all very well this um, uh, formula of the, um, how we can calculate the, uh, the diameters in case of a bifurcation. But what is important here, uh, understand that this means a mismatch between distal branch and proximal main branch. But we have to understand that the larger the side branch, the larger this mismatch is. And this is exactly the case in, in, for left main, where the side branch, the circumflex, is normally a huge vessel, meaning that the mismatch between LAD and left main, the mismatch between circumflex and left main is normally huge. Accordingly, we need a stent which has a good expansion capacity and this is a great advantage of the Resolute, where you can really reach um, uh, with maximum expansion plus 1 to 1.5 millimeter as compared to the nominal diameter. Let's talk about the side cell challenge now. So side cell, you have this image here. Uh, this is definitely what you don't want to see in case of, uh, of uh, bifurcation PCI, that you rewire the jail branch and your balloon doesn't open to the diameter what you are aiming for. Again, for resolute, you can see what kind of diameters you can reach, which is uh, reaching uh, up to almost five millimeter uh, side branch size for the largest design, but even for the smaller design, you have almost four millimeter diameter for the side branch, which sounds really good for uh, large bifurcations. And finally, the guiding catheter challenge. You all know very well when you have a, a gentle guiding catheter, then it's not much supportive, or you choose a supportive guide, but it's more aggressive. And this is uh, really an issue in case of uh, left main PCI. Why? because you have a moment when the, the, the stent is not yet opposed well in the left main, but your guiding tends to engage in the, in the left main. And what happens then, it compresses longitudinally your freshly implanted stent. How you can avoid this? First of all, you have to be a careful interventionist, nicely disengage the guide, but you also need a good stent which, which uh, resists somewhat to, to these forces. From design point of view, what you see in, uh, in the case of Resolute Onyx, you have uh, a single wire design which allows uh, this nice conformability to expand to these uh, large diameters. And the truly rounded struts allows you an easy, easy access uh, to the jail branches. As you have seen, uh, it has a very broad size matrix, which is really ideal for large bifurcations. And thanks to the platinum uh, iridium core, it allows you a good visibility uh, for accurate positioning. Again, summarizing what makes a uh, stand ideal for left main PCI. First of all, what you want to have in case of left main PCI a complex bifurcation, good expansion and a position from the first end, which in this case can reach up to six millimeter, but also a good expansion and a position for the, for the second stand which is again case up to six millimeter for onyx. You need a very good cell opening to, to open it to the size of LED and the size of the circumflex and a certain compression resistance uh, at the level of the ostium. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Gabor. This was excellent overview. I think now we should go to uh, in details uh, into the results. Uh, when we discuss first the provisional arm, provisional stepwise, Dave, there were uh, uh, less consumables, uh, less radiation, shorter procedure. Uh, can you elaborate on importance of these findings for our contemporary daily practice? These factors are important for daily practice because, of course, you know, the more complicated you make something, the more likely you are to have some um, difficulties with the procedures or adverse events. I mean, in the setting of a clinical trial, of course, people are extremely careful and in extremely rigorous in how they do things. In general uh, clinical work, though, uh, mistakes are more easily made. So I think any procedure that limits the amount of uh, products you use, limits the number of exchanges, limits the number of times you go in and out and in and out of the coronary arteries should be beneficial really in terms of limiting 
the number of novel complications that you can create by doing something unnecessarily complicated. Thanks. Uh, Gabor, uh, may I ask you uh, in daily practice, uh, in your daily practice, uh, do you uh, use a specific device uh, selection? Uh, I, I like very much the presentation about all technical advantages of new generation of DES, uh, especially Resolutonics for, that we use for EBC main, but how much complexity of the lesion determines the strategy and uh, do you start as a provisional or you are planning upfront and which technique if, it, if it's two-stand strategy upfront? So uh, the first question was on device selection. I think the key for device selection is the opening capacity. So this is what you want to be sure that your stent will open large enough in the, in the segment of left main. And uh, quite often, this is what determines your, your stent selection. Regarding the technique, um, I, I, I love the idea of provisional saying that I have chances during the procedure to, to decide for one or other technique. Although I think uh, if we want to be honest, everyone has already an idea at the beginning which technique it will end or with which technique it can end. So I would say I, my approach is mainly the provisional. If I need to complete it to stents, um, I, I like uh, the concept of going further with, uh, with culotte or DK culotte. On the other hand, depending on the anatomy, there are situations when, when uh, you say you, you start for the circumflex, making the access easier towards the, the LAD when you want to treat it with culotte. So in this way, uh, these are more or less my decision-making process, uh, depending a bit on the anatomy. So in accordance with contemporary EBC consensus documents, we follow on the provisional pathway. And uh, after optimizing the result in the main vessel, you proceed depending on anatomy with T-TAP or culotte, or uh, congratulations on nice paper in your intervention of double kissing culotte, which is actually combination of provisional towards one branch and then provisional with kissing towards the other branch. But we also have the refinement of DK crush. And I would like to invite now Prof Zhang to present a DK crush case contemporary performed in Nanjing First Hospital. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Dr. Jun Jie Zhang from China. It's my great honor to give the presentation about DK crush in the left man bifurcation. I have nothing to disclosure. So let me show you one case about the distal left man bifurcation lesions. This is a 78 gentleman presented with unstable angina. The baseline angiography show significant lesion as a distal left man and also involve the ostimo circumflex. So it's a traditional Medina 101 bifurcation lesions. For this particular case, my decision is to perform DK crush with IVAS guidance. So before I insert the IVAS to AID or circumflex, I use a 2.5 balloon to do the predilation in the circumflex. Then I use IVAS to assess the distal FM bifurcation lesions. So proximal AID, there is the landing zoom. The vessel size, was four millimeter. And this is the ostal LAD. Although from the angiography, it looks normal, but from I was imaging, you can see there is a, there was 70, 57% uh, blood burden. And also there is a significant lesion in the left man after 2.5 balloon predilation. And the left man vessel size was larger than 4.5 millimeter. This is a significant lesion of circumflex after 2.5 balloon predilation, very eccentric plaque. This is a proximal circumflex landing zoom. The vessel size is 3.5. So according to the IVAS assessment, I decided the stand size and the stand landing zoom. So I first use a 3.5 balloon 
three point five stand by eighteen to recover the ostium circumflex with the minimal protruding into the left main two or three millimeter, and deploy the circumflex stand. Then this is the step two of DK crush, balloon crush. I use a 3.5 balloon to crush the circumflex stem protruding into left man. Before I do the first kissing balloon inflation, I rewind the circumflex from the proximal cell, avoid the distal excess. Then do the first kissing balloon inflation, 3.5 balloon in circumflex and the LAD. Then followed by step four of DK crush, man vessel standing, four, four by 18 stand, fully covered from the osteo left man to proximal LED. Then before I second the rewind circumflex, I use a 4.5 bloom to do the port, make the left man stem fully expansion and the well position. Then second the rewind the circumflex, from the proximal to mid cell. So sequentially, I use a 3.5 balloon and the four balloon to do the post dilate LED and the circumflex. Then finished with the kissing balloon inflation at a media pressure. Finally, still use a 4.5 balloon to do the report. This is the final step of DK crush. So this is a very beautiful result of the angiogram. Of course, I will check the iris. Iris imaging show minimal stain area of left man up to 12 square millimeter. For circumflex, minimal stain area up to eight square millimeter. For optimal LED, minimum stain area up to 10 square millimeter. It's an optimal result. So, 30 months later, the patient was called back to the routine angiograph follow up. The patient was symptomatic. Angiogram showed fantastic result. There is no any instant stenosis. The stain was patent. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to present you a case uh, which we uh, did with uh, DK Culotte in the left main at the University Heart Center Graz using uh, Onyx, demonstrating uh, why and, and how uh, this procedure can be performed. So our patient is a, is a young man uh, with CCS2 angina, high syntax score, uh, with an occluded right and a complex bifurcation lesion in the left main. And he was refused for, for surgery due to comorbidities, so we had to go on with PCI. And I would like to focus now on uh, the treatment of the left main. Here you can see the NGO, and I like to emphasize that if you look at carefully, you see that the, the disease involves the left, the distal left main and the LAD quite long and the circumflex quite long. So considering this uh, um, uh, decision-making algorithm suggested by the Bifurcation Club, uh, we decided to go for culotte, actually to go for uh, a double kissing culotte. Uh, and when we decide for this, first of all, it's very important to check the feasibility. So we did imaging to check the diameters in the, in the, in the different branches to understand whether we can really uh, treat this lesion uh, with uh, this technique. And then you just go to the expansion chart, understanding whether your, your stent, which is selected according to the distal branch, can reach the diameter of the proximal main branch, which is left main in this case. And it was according to the, the expansion chart and the, the OCT findings should not be a problem. So this, what are the steps of the procedure? First of all, after lesion preparation, we stent the, the left main to the LAD with one long stent. And knowing that this will result in a ma massive malaposition in the left main, as next step, we perform a proximal optimization. During proximal optimization, 
uh, so I mean, after this, this step, it's very important to disengage the guide to protect our freshly implanted stand from the, uh, from the compression of the guiding catheter. Once it's done, the next step is the rewiring. Very important, we try to go for the distal cell rewiring um, in order to minimize uh, uh, the neocarina, as you can see here, by going distal, pulling back, turning down. Um, uh, you can just get to the uh, 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 to the uh, side branch, and after this, you can check it with imaging. Uh, uh, check it with imaging the the proper position. This follows by the first uh, kissing dilation. If you, when you perform a VK culotte, and I will show you in the next. Um, Slide why is it important? So kissing you do with the two balloons sized according to the two distal branches. And here you can see why it's important. In regular culotte, once you open to the side branch and you put your stand, look at what happens in the ostium of the, uh, the other branch. Look at this major uh, deformation of the stand. As compared to that, when you do first a proper kissing dilation and then you position the stand afterward, Nothing happens in the ostium, so it's easy to un understand why it's important to do double kissing. In the first case, it's it's a wishful thinking that you can wire properly afterwards the 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 uh, the branch. While in the second case, you see it's a nicely paved way. So after kissing dilation, we can position the the second stand, and while we position the second stand again, sizing according to the distal diameter. The same story that uh, you put the stand and you try to disengage the guide again to protect your stand from, uh, from, uh, from longitudinal deformation. And once it's done, your next step is proximal optimization again. When proximal optimization was done, same story uh, 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 that you revire the, the, your first uh, branch again with distal crossing, why distal crossing, because you want to minimize uh, the neocarina. And you can uh, perform here imaging to confirm that your wire is not behind the struts anywhere and the wire is really crossed through the optimal cell what you wanted. Once it's done, you perform again the kissing dilation. This is the second kissing dilation, again sized according to the distal branches, and when it's done, you finish the procedure with the final proximalization, proximal optimization with a good result. So if you compare to baseline, the final result looks really nice. I just want to show uh, this OCT imaging. Of course, it's suboptimal from OCT point of view, uh, from OCT quality point of view, but this is the apposition what you really want to see in the left main or in the case of any PCI, and this can you can only reach if you have a stand which really can expand to large diameters. Um, for everyone who was worried about the right, I would like to show that in the second procedure we performed the CTO uh, uh, PCI of the right coronary artery. So just to finalize and just to uh, to uh, just to. Uh, conclude what we did here, we decided for a DK kilot. And what is DK kilot? If you follow the steps, you have to realize that DK culotte is actually nothing else but a provisional towards the LAD and the provisional towards the cyber to the circumflex. So two time provisional, provisional, repeating the steps of provisional, then you finish with a DK culotte. This was our case. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much to both of you for great presentation on the contemporary step-by-step -step performance of DK crash and double kissing culotte. We have several questions coming from the chat box and I thank you all for putting your questions. We will continue this discussion on the social network. So please go on on the Twitter and uh, just make sure that we could have possibility to see your questions and discuss. Uh, Dave, uh, you know the data, so I will have a couple of very quick questions for you. What were the rates of pot and kiss in two groups? You said it was mandatory. Yeah, so um, the the as you go through the progression in each arm, fundamentally people stayed very closely adherent to the protocol. Uh, so roughly ninety five percent or thereabouts had uh, initial predilatation uh, and a stent implant. 
The pop rate in the provisional strategy was over 90%. Um, the, I think there was slight confusion from one of the people asking the questions about the uh, percentage rate of kissing inflation in the um, provisional group. Uh, in that group, essentially, again, around 90% had a kissing inflation done. Then, 20%, roughly speaking, had a second stent. And in that 20%, all of them then went on to have a repeat kiss done. So I hope that's clear in the stepwise progression of, of what is seen in the matrix. Yeah, I think this is extremely important to clarify. So more than above 90% kissing as, as it was part of the procedure and 100% of those who received second stent had also final kissing done according to our principles, high pressure separate and then uh, simultaneous balloon inflation. Uh, what was the most frequent uh, second stent bailout strategy? This is the question. So please clarify stepwise versus bailout. Okay, yes. I mean, obviously for, for bailout, there wasn't any DK crush. Uh, it, was, it was equally divided between Culotte, T, and TAP, actually. Um, and, of course, the numbers are relatively small now, so we're only talking 50 patients. But, um, yes, again, the, the mini culotte was favoured. Yes. Uh, and the third question that I think it's, again, coming back to uh, imaging in EBC main, uh, could you elaborate more on the use of imaging in both uh, treatment arms? Yeah, it's an interesting one. I mean, the rate of imaging was lower than we might have expected, roughly 35% across the board. Uh, it was also not significantly higher amongst those who had a dedicated two-stent strategy than it was amongst those who were provisional. Um, there are also some early indications about uh, whether IVUS um, use was advantageous in terms of outcome, uh, curiously favoring the provisional strategy rather than the two-step strategy. So this is stuff which actually is still the subject of some discussion and uh, investigation, and there will be further uh, information coming on this in due course. <clears throat> but um, yes, overall, even for a randomized trial, perhaps surprisingly low rates of uh, intravascular imaging used. Thank you very much, Dave, but thank you again for executing this really important study. I remember in the last five years how many emails I received from you uh, covering uh, <laughs> and being so uh, uh, unhappy because of the slow recruitment. Congratulations <laughs> on persistence, you and the CERC for great performance. Uh, we thank have you. neutral results. Uh, numbers are going in favor of provisional so I'll give you a, a word at the end to, to conclude the main findings. I would like to know uh, our great philosopher from the EBC is Professor Jens Lassen. I would like to know how he interprets the importance of EBC main in contemporary available evidence. Thank you, Thank you very much, Goran, uh, and, and uh, for this opportunity. I think it's uh, a fantastic result of a trial which actually compare philosophy against uh, a, a dichotomous choice. So I, I'm not, well, surprised by the neutral result, but, but I'm very happy to see that there's a kind of a trend because this actually, for me, makes it safe to embark on a provisional strategy. And that actually, for the great majority of patients, will result in a low number of metal in the left main. There's a lot of, well, uh, technical issues we haven't really discussed uh, in, in this trial, but one thing is actually that exactly the takeoff of the circumflex is one of the areas of the ventricle that twists the most, which means that there could be actually in the long run uh, stent fractures with two stents and all that kind of things. We don't really know that because we don't have long uh, time results. So from my perspective, this trial is exactly what we are doing today 
because sometimes we use upfront to stand techniques. Uh, and I think uh, uh, we heard it very well, and it was very well depicted from the DK cross uh, 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 stenting from, from China. If there's a long lesion in the, in, in, in the side plans, if, and you don't really want to advance, then it's a good choice. But for the vast majority of patients, this trial actually uh, support by strong feelings that you should go provisional because it has equal results and it makes the procedure more simple, quick, safe, and swift. Uh we touched upon a, a lot of multiple important issues in this great session. I thank you very much to all the faculty and thank you very much to all our attendees. And I would like to invite you to continue discussion on the social media. Have a great Europe PCR 2021.